at the handout. Now, I don't know if you have all got that. There are some at the front here, if anybody hasn't got one, because I think it is important that we should have that. Um, any papers? No? Right. Uh, there isn't really time in what we've got available at this weekend to have a comprehensive uh, review of abortion law. We could spend a whole week talking about that and all sorts of cases and bits and pieces. This is really just a taster to give you some idea. And as I say, what I put out on these sheets is the abortion law in England and Wales. It doesn't cover Scotland, although some of it does, but Scotland is slightly different. Um, and it, some of it does apply in Northern Ireland. The Abortion Act certainly applies in Northern Ireland. It doesn't apply in Northern Ireland, I think it's fine. And it doesn't apply, none of this applies in Southern Ireland. But there's general principles I wanted just to uh, explain to, to you. And the first thing I wanted to say is abortion law did not start with the Abortion Act in 1967. I mean, we haven't really heard anything uh, about the law before. 1967, but there was a lot of law, and in effect, abortion was um, prohibited, although with some qualification, which I'll just explain to you. Um, and the first thing I put on here is the Offence Against the Person Act, 1861, but actually, uh, that was a um, Reenactment of what had been in 1803 Act, Lord Ellenborough Act, and even that was based upon what had been the common law in England. That's the law which is made by the judges in dealing with particular cases. And this gentleman on the right here is Sir Edmund Cook, spelled C O K, but uh, pronounced Cook, who was preeminent lawyer, uh, and he lived from. 1552 to 1634. Now it hadn't occurred to me until just the last couple of days, um, why should that be when the law was being uh, underlain, somebody like that. And of course, it's immediately after the Reformation. And in the time of the Reformation in England, all the monasteries, abbeys, churches, ecclesiastical, um, administration was scrapped by the government and so in effect the English lawyers had to pick up the work that the ecclesiastical courts have been dealing with. Now I'm not a historian so I don't know whether this is true or not but it just occurred to me that uh, it was interesting that he was speaking about this thing and uh, making rules about it um, which continued for some time. And I read a, a report, somebody said that abortion was punishable in the royal courts well before the first statutory provision of the offence in 1803, that's the Lord Edinburgh Act which I mentioned, which this repeats. Uh, that is apparent from the leading contemporary treaties. Sir, Edmund, Sir Edward Cook, 1552 to 1634, in his third institute, classified abortion resulting in stillbirth as a great misprision and abortion resulting in death after a live birth as murder. Sergeant Hawkins, Sir William Blackstone, Sir Edward Hyde East, and Sir William Russell all followed Cook. So the law was being set up um, at that time and that eventually was uh, enacted by Parliament uh, in the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act, which incidentally covered a whole range of offences, including uh, interfering with a clergyman in the execution of the duty and all sorts of things like that. But <coughs> these two sections, uh, well, you've got them on your sheet here. Section 58 and 59 dealt with specifically abortion. And section 58 dealt with dealing with the procedure of abortion itself. And 59 was uh, prohibiting providing the instruments and the medicines for doing it. Um, what I just want to point out to you in both, uh, in that act, is the uh, use of the word child and miscarriage, because they come in later on. Now that continued as the offence, uh, as the act related to abortion, uh, 
for a long time. In after the First World War, um, there was a problem which arose of uh, children being killed at the time of birth. Now, in those days, cesarean section was extremely dangerous because antibiotics hadn't been invented. So if you were going to carry out a, a cesarean section, then the chances were the woman would die. Uh, it was a very high possibility. And so if there was a complication at the time of birth, not to put too fine a point on it, the child would be cut to pieces and taken out of the mother's body, which would kill the child. And there was a, a thought that that could fall between the offences of abortion and murder. If it was done at the time of birth, it might be before the child was expelled or after the child was expelled, and you might end up with the wrong uh, offence being charged. So, in 1929, the offence against uh, the Infant Life Preservation Act was brought in, which created a new offence of child destruction, which was intended to plug that gap. And what it says in it is if you charge somebody with abortion or with child destruction or with murder and during the course of the trial it appears that uh, the evidence shows that some other offence has been committed then you can change track tack to the offence but the interesting thing about that act is that it said in it that the only defence for child destruction uh, was if, if, if the act was done for the sole purpose of saving the mother's life. In that case, the person carrying out the procedure would be let off. And that was the first sort of chink in the armour of abortion legislation. Previously, it had been uh, completely uh, prohibited. <coughs> then, if you look on these sheets that I've put out here, you see at the bottom of the first page, case of R.V. Bourne. Dr. Bourne was. Um, a consultant, a, a Harley Street consultant, he was presented with a case of a young woman, a 15 year old woman, who had been raped by three guardsmen and she'd become pregnant. Um, and he went to the police station and said, I'm going to carry out an abortion on this woman. And the police said, Don't do it. He did, and he was duly prosecuted and ended up in the Old Bailey. And the just the um, judge in that case, Mr. Justice McNaughton, made a summing up to the jury. So this is a criminal, criminal case, of course. So he's, he's summing up to the jury. And he said to them, um, if you look at the 1861 Act, which is the act that he was prosecuted under, it talks about unlawfully administering poison, whatever. So he said, it must be possible, therefore, lawfully to do this. So what does that mean? What, one, what were they thinking of as being a lawful abortion. Then he looked at the 1929 Act, no reason why he should do, but he did, and said in the 1829 Act, uh, the 1929 Act, it says that if you um, carry out this procedure to kill the child for the sole purpose of saving the mother's life, then that's a defence. Trouble was, of course, that this girl wasn't in danger of death. So he said, well, when we say life, we don't mean life or death, we mean life, <laughs> life. And he came up with a proposal to the jury saying, if you find that this abortion was carried out to save this woman from becoming a physical or mental wreck, then he's not guilty. And the jury did decide that he was not, uh, that he was preventing this woman from becoming a physical or mental wreck, and he was let off. And that was the um, case, that, that the, Dr. Bourne's case was used as sort of justification for abortion from then on. If abortion was done to save a woman from becoming a physical or mental wreck, then it was okay for the doctors to, to do it. Um, just while I'm talking about doctors, I'll break off from this speech about law um, to say to you, if there are any of you here who are doctors or who are interested in uh, medical matters, and particularly would like to subscribe to the Catholic Medical Quarterly, which is at the back, uh, of which there are several copies, then please take a copy, um, and those of you who perhaps don't fall in that category, it's there, so do take advantage of taking it home with you while you can. Yeah,
Fortlessly introduced. Uh, so um, that, that was the case from uh, 1939 onwards, and there were several attempts to uh, liberalise the abortion law, which occurred after that. And you know who this gentleman is because you've seen his photograph of uh, one of the speakers yesterday, David Steele. David Steele was uh, the youngest member of parliament in 1966. He came third in the private member's ballot. And if you become one, two or three, then you have a good chance of getting your uh, bill through. And he introduced the medical termination of pregnancy bill. And actually, if you, you're too young, but in 1966, there was a Labour government came in, which was all for reform, and, and, and they did all sorts of things, changed the divorce law and so on, and the abortion law was one thing that they had got their sights on. And Roy Jenkins, who was the Home Secretary, took a lot of trouble to make sure there was sufficient time for this private member's bill to get through Parliament. It's very rare that private member's bills become law, but in this case it did, um, because of the time that he gave it. It was called the... Um, medical termination of pregnancy bill as a sort of uh, smokescreen for the, while it went through Parliament. And as soon as it became law, it was named the Abortion Act. I would say there was no public outcry at the time for amending the Abortion Act, but nevertheless, uh, that is what happened. And SPUC, incidentally, was formed at the time that um, the medical termination of pregnancy bill was going through Parliament, so 1966, to oppose it. And none of the founding members were Catholics. One of the founding members, incidentally, was Dr. Ball, because he saw that what he had done, what it was going to lead to, and he was shocked and horrified by that. That is a, a slide showing the first page of the Abortion Act as it was originally uh, enacted, enacted. And the reason I've shown this is I'm not expecting you to read it from that <laughs> distance, but you can see that the length of section one, it's quite brief. In there, in there, that inset paragraph are the circumstances in which abortion can be carried out. Uh, there's not a lot of point in going back to that in detail because in 1990, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, instead of the Abortion Act, is on the back page of the sheet of paper you've got. Um, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act of 1990 expanded the Abortion Act, the, those two sections, but those two subsections which I showed to you. And looking on this sheet of paper again, the words that were inserted by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act are in square brackets. Um, so this is the law under which we in England and Wales are um, subject at the moment. And I just want to highlight some of the words in there, because as I say, we could spend the whole week just talking about this act and going through it line by line and all the rest of it. But I just want to point out some of the words to you, um, because they do have some significance. The first thing to say is in section one, subsection one A, it says, a person shall not be guilty of an offence. So the Abortion Act did not repeal any of the previous law. It didn't repeal the Offence Against the Person Act. It, said, it simply said, if you do what we tell you to do in this act, you will not be guilty of an offence. Which is a sort of cop-out way of dealing with, with it. Uh, <coughs> the act is purely permissive. If you do this, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, but if you do do it, then you will not be guilty of an offence. 
And later on in the bill, which I'm not going to go speak about at the moment, but in section four of the bill, you see further down the page, there's a right of conscientious objection, which itself was a sop to the people who were objecting to the bill at the time, because they could say, well, there's nobody has to be involved in this if they don't want to. Some years later, a case came up called um, the Department of Health in Janaway. Janaway was a lady who was a secretary in the hospital, and she refused to, um, to book people appointments for abortion because uh, she it was against her conscience. And she uh, objected to that, but she was told by the court, well, no, you do, you do not participate in abortion, therefore you can't uh, do it. As you have heard also in just this year, last year, um, two midwives have also been told now that they uh, cannot use this constant objection clause. So what was intended as a great sop in 1966-67 turns out to be pretty useless. Um, but anyway, there we are. It, it, it's there in, in the act. These are weasel words. When a pregnancy is terminated, this is the same subject, subsection we were looking at before. When a pregnancy is terminated, there's no mention in here of child or miscarriage. So when a pregnancy is terminated, Every pregnancy is terminated. When our mothers were pregnant with us, the pregnancy was terminated. Not in the way that they, that's implied here, but um, nonetheless, it did happen. And it's, again, the weasel words of hiding behind a sort of vague idea of what's, what we're getting at. Uh, what they're implying is it's a termination where a child is killed but they don't have the guts, they don't have the nerve actually to put that in the, in the bill itself. And I would say this is a deliberate attempt to hide the existence of human children behind the smokescreen of a pregnancy to be terminated or continued. In effect, bearing a child then becomes like a disease, heart disease, cancer, whatever it is. If the cancer could be terminated, then we carry on with life. Forgetting, of course, that in, when pregnancy is terminated, then somebody else's life ceases. Um, even so, um, the Abortion Act in '67 didn't get rid of the idea of child. It couldn't just they just could not get rid of it. And if you look further down at 11D talks about there's a substantial risk that if the child were born, if the child were born, so it's coming out into the open there, uh, if the child, because there was no way they could find to hide that. Um, so we're talking about a human child, and there we are. Do any of you know who this gentleman is on the right here? Sorry? Kermit Gosnell who was a gynecologist in uh, West Philadelphia, in America, who performed some 16,000 abortions over 31 years in his clinic. It's estimated that he was making 1.1 million pounds a year, uh, and he saved money by hiring unqualified staff. Uh, one anaesthetist had never finished high school. And District Attorney Seth Williams ties Gosnell's attitude to money directly to the murders. In a legal abortion, the fetus is injected with a legal drug before the mother gives birth, but Gosnell didn't do this. That takes money and it would be cheaper for him just to induce labor and then murder the child, <coughs> the Attorney General said. Now this is an American doctor, I understand that, and we're talking about English law. So, uh, but it just shows you what uh, the attitude of uh, that can be fostered once you say well, yeah, you can carry out abortion. It brings out this sort of attitude. He was killing children. He was terminating pregnancies, okay, but that's not the point. In 1968, the year after the abortion act came into force, there were 23,641 legal abortions. 
Um, by 2013, that had gone up to 190,000 legal abortions in this country. So it's just the scale of it is, is horrendous. And that in the act. Um, and which the parliamentarians knew was ne were never going to be complied with. I mean, we've heard from other speakers this weekend how things have been um, misinterpreted and just really ignored. Uh, the abortion, so they said, had to be done by a registered medical practitioner. And again, this is a sop to the parliamentarians and to the people like us who are objecting to it. Oh, it's going to be a doctor who's doing it. It's not just any old person. It's going to be a registered medical practitioner. But registered medical practitioners are no different from, in terms of moral and ethical attitudes, from anybody else, from plumbers or whatever. Yes, okay, they get taught about ethics, medical ethics and so on. But uh, they're still human beings. And it's all very well saying this in the Act. But there was a case in 1981 the RCM versus DHSS, when the question was raised, um, is it in order for nurses to carry out abortions? Because what was happening was that uh, women, women would be injected with prostaglandins, which induced uh, birth before the due time. And in effect, then the nurses were carrying out the abortion. Although it was under the supervision of a doctor who would sit in his office and was aware of what was going on. But the, the Royal College of Nursing were not happy about their members being asked to do this. And they really applied for um, confirmation that it was in order to do it. Um, and the court said, yes, it was. It was held that the phrase treatment for the termination of pregnancy means something broader than the act of termination itself. Rather, it contemplated treatment that was in the nature of a team effort covering the whole process designed to bring about, bring about a termination. So nominally by a registered medical practitioner, but there we are. And Lord Diplock, who was one of the judges, said, what the Act sets out to do is to provide an exhaustive statement of the circumstances in which treatment for the termination of a pregnancy may be carried out lawfully. Uh, and he also said, the policy of the Act, it seems to me, is clear. There are two aspects to it. The first is to broaden the grounds upon which abortion may be lawfully obtained. The second is to ensure that the abortion is carried out with all proper <coughs> skill and in hygienic conditions. Well, if that's what it meant, why didn't it say that in, in the Act? Uh, the truth is, A, they wanted to say well, it to be carried out by a medically qualified doctor, and B, the idea of prostaglandin abortions hadn't been thought of in 1966. Uh, but there we are, that's, that's what the Act says. Those are the words in the Act. It goes on to say, again, in this, and we haven't got out of that first subsection A yet, if two registered medical practitioners are of the opinion, uh, and again, another SOP to the objectors, We'll have two doc doctors, you know, approving this. And what's the reality of that? Well, you may have seen the newspapers. There's been a scandal in the last two or three years, and even before that, of these um, abortion certificates being pre-signed, signed by people who have never seen the patient. In some some occasions, neither of the doctors has seen the patient, and certainly. It's quite common for, or very common for, one of them never to have seen the patient because they say, well, if my colleague, Dr. So-and-so, thinks it's okay, then I agree with that. There was even a draw, in, in one hospital, they found a drawer full of blank signed forms by a doctor who had left the employment of the hospital some time before. And, um, and these are all just sort of administrative problems which... Uh, uh, cause a bit of a stink, but nothing, uh, and the politicians wring their hands over it, but nothing actually gets done about it. And as I said, doctors are assumed to have a great moral status based upon the belief that they have given this Hippocratic Oath, and as we heard yesterday, um, doctors don't uh, make the Hippocratic Oath at all, don't give the Hippocratic Oath. 
by and large, um, for various reasons. What I was just wanted to say about add to that, incidentally, is just to sort of put it into context for you. Um, when Hippocrates was alive, he was alive two and a half thousand years ago. In other words, 500 years before Christ was born. So, and yet he was saying, um, I will do no abortion, I will do any euthanasia. And the reason why he did that was because there were lots of quack doctors in his society. And he wanted people to know that if they were dealing with this doctor who has signed my oath, then you're dealing with a proper doctor. If they haven't signed your oath, you're dealing with a quack doctor. It didn't need Christianity. I mean, it's, it, it almost transcends Christianity. Christianity accepted, of course, because it's God's law, but it's the natural law. And we heard, um, it, you know, it's, the, it's the natural law uh, that uh, you don't kill a human child. So I just wanted to explain that to you. Again, it goes still in the same subsection. Formed in good faith. Now, that's a wonderful phrase. Good faith is a wonderful phrase for lawyers because it's almost impossible to um, prove bad faith. You can be um, stupid, you can be incompetent, irrational, mistaken, even negligent. But proving uh, that uh, someone is, has acted not in good faith is almost impossible. Again, it's something possibly politicians wouldn't have understood, but I think professional lawyers and doctors would have said, oh, well, that's, there's our get out clause for us. Um, so, and you can see my little picture of uh, Pinocchio with his growing nose. I, I would like to just say a few words about uh, this, which was introduced by the Human Fertilization Embryology Act in 1990, wasn't in the Act in 1967, and this says that, uh, where is it? Here, the, the, the pregnancy has not exceeded its 24th week, and this is, we're now getting to sort of time limits, and this was introduced following an attempt by David Alton, Lord Alton as he is now, to um, introduce a private member's bill which would have a prohibited abortion after 18 weeks. It was talked out uh, and the deal was, uh, as I understand it, that the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, which was uh, coming up for, dealing, for being dealt with, would, it, would include a clause about abortion, inserting a time limit. Um, and that's what happened. Margaret Thatcher agreed to that, and it duly went in. Now, first of all, the idea of a time limit is a bad idea. I mean, killing a child at any time is a bad thing to do. Uh, in any event, I think this uh, inclusion of the 24th week was actually an increase in the time limit. Most abortions, something like 80, 90% maybe, are done before the 12th week, in fact. So even 18 weeks is not going to make a huge difference. Um, under that 1929 Act that I looked at before, that um, talked about killing a child capable of being born alive. And uh, 24 weeks, it's perfectly possible that a child might be um, capable of being born alive at that, at that stage of their uh, development. It says the fact that a child is, that a pregnancy has lasted 28 weeks is conclusive proof that that child was capable of being born alive and must not therefore be killed. Um, and so what crept up was the idea that abortion was illegal after 28 weeks. It wasn't. Abortion was illegal after the moment a child became capable of being born alive. 
which would vary in every case. Difficult to prove, maybe, but nevertheless uh, possible. And 24 weeks was, uh, it went against what David Alter was looking for, but he failed to understand that the forces against him were um, very strong. And that's uh, what happened with that. But in addition to that, uh, <coughs> abortion of handicapped children was permitted right up to the time of birth which had not been permitted before 1990, under the Abortion Act as originally drafted. That wasn't allowed. Once the child was capable of being born alive, whatever its physical condition was, um, in terms of handicap or disablement, then uh, that child was protected. Um, then the 24-week time limit doesn't apply to children who are disabled. So all in all, I would have said that that was an increase in the time limit. In fact, I'm sure there's an increase in the time limit. So I just wanted to add in, uh, finish, to sit there with some additional words that are put in uh, really as stops to, um, uh, to, to the um, objectives of the time. Here we have uh, the pregnancy has not exceeded the 24th week, and the continuous the pregnancy would, would involve risk greater than if the pregnancy were terminated. This is just a purely sub subjective <coughs> condition. I mean, how are you going to tell that the risk is greater? I mean, you're trying to look into the future. Who's got a crystal ball that can do that? Um, it's just, um, and that the termination is necessary to prevent grave, permanent injury to the physical and mental health of the pregnant woman. I mean, again, who's, how are you going to be able to tell that? And these, the cases that are done under these headings, incidentally, are very, very small. Uh, Paul mentioned something like 97% of abortions are carried out because they're unwanted pregnancies, so-called. Uh, nothing to do with disablement or anything like that. Uh, so this is really frittering around the edges. And uh, I just want to mention to you the fact that even by 1990, they could not remove the word <coughs> child from, from the law. Uh, and this is to do with the disablement. The continuity brings would involve risk to the life of the pregnant woman. Oh, no, sorry. the wrong slide. Uh, that was, that was, no. Sorry, I've got all mixed up now. Um, yes, the, the word child is in, was in the Abortion Act, as I mentioned to you before, in the original Abortion Act. So, it's, the law has, um, was passed on a, a, an attitude of, um, uh, of uh, sympathy, emotion. It was passed on uh, grounds of emotion. And I just want to point out to you as well, in section five of this act, the Abortion Act, the 1990 Act, Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, added in this clause five, because it's in square brackets, as you can see, and the use of the word fetus all over their place in that clause. Quite incorrect, because fetus is a fully developed unborn child. And, as I said, most abortions now are carried out before 12 weeks. And before 12 <coughs> weeks, um, the child will be an embryo or coming up to becoming a a fetus. So the justification for carrying out these abortions in section 5 uh, doesn't, doesn't really stand up to, to the law. So I haven't uh, gone through the act in great detail with you because as I say it would take all day and take a lot of brain power uh, and a lot of working out for us to be clear how this <coughs> thing applies and it doesn't really apply as, as we've heard over this weekend. But what I would like you to do, particularly those of you, any of you who are law students or lawyers, 
to take this sheet of paper home with you and keep it. And when somebody says to you, well, the abortion act allows abortion, you say, no, it doesn't. What it, no, sorry, abortion is legal under the abortion act. You say, no, it's not legal under the abortion act. It's only that no offence will be committed if you comply with its clauses. Abortion is still illegal. The 1861 Act still applies. And if you can't qualify under the abortion act, then that's what you're going to be prosecuted under. And I think on that point I'll uh, finish and hand over to this young lady here.